Hello, Bruce Adolph with episode 10. When I hear the word test, my first thought is of sitting in a large gymnasium in elementary school with hundreds of other kids, all of us using number two pencils to fill in the ovals that represented the correct answer in an endless multiple choice exam. At Juilliard, I had to give tests when I taught music theory in the pre-college, and I created for fun multiple choice questions that were impossible to get wrong, or almost impossible. The most popular multiple choice question was, the cadence illustrated below is A. Plagal, B. Bagel, C. Croissant, D. Muffet. Teaching solfege is practically all testing. Solfege is sometimes called ear training, and outside of the music community, few people have heard the expression ear training. A few months after I first started teaching ear training in the 70s, I had a cold that led to my ears being clogged for a few days, so I made an appointment with an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat specialist. The ENT's office was like a museum of ear, nose, and throat art. There were noses on pedestals and posters of the throat, but the ear won hands down for a variety of representations. I sat in the patient chair and the doctor casually asked me, so what do you do for a living? I could have said that I was a musician or a composer, but I said, I teach ear training. He said, ear training? I can't believe this, but I have no idea what ear training is. I told him, it's really music training focused on being able to recognize aspects of music by ear for musicians, professional training, you might say. He relaxed and continued the exam. If the ENT wanted to know more about ear training, he should have visited the classes at Juilliard of René Longy. Madame Longy introduced herself to my class on the first day by saying, There is no truth to the rumor that I had an affair with Claude Debussy. Her teaching style was French as we understood it. Strict rules with no exceptions ever, rigorously thorough and meticulous in all aspects and poker-faced manner that could suddenly flash a smile when one of us performed to her liking. Dictations in Madame Longy's class were uniquely challenging. Normal melodic dictations would have been easy for everyone in this class, which was comprised of composers, conductors, pianists, and organists. But Madame Longy's approach was the following. We would have to write 10 notes, all on the same space or line of the staff. She would then play a string rapidly of 10 notes. And we had to write the clefts and accidentals in front of the notes already written so that they would correctly represent what she had played. For example, a note on the top line of the staff would be an F in treble clef, an A in bass clef, an E in tenor clef, a G in alto clef, a D in soprano clef, a C in baritone clef, and a B in mezzo-soprano clef. That's right, you heard me. Mezzo-soprano clef. By using seven clefs, all seven note names are possible on any one line or space of the staff, and by employing sharps and flats during the dictation, any melodic line could now be written with clefts and accidentals using only that one line or that one space. One rule that applied to everything in the class was this. The first thing you say counts as your answer. If Madame Longy asked you a question and you said, uh, she considered, uh, to be the answer, and you would get an F in her record book for that particular question. If she played a chord on the piano and pointed at you and said, what is that chord? And you said, uh, C sharp half diminished. She counted only the, uh, even if C sharp half diminished had been the correct answer. This could be infuriating. But eventually, none of us in that class ever uttered an extraneous syllable. And Madame Longy applied the rule to herself, too, as you will hear later on in the story. 
1972, I again took Madame Langy's class. The group was nearly identical to the previous year, as it was a requirement to take this course for three years if your major was composition, conducting piano, or organ. We were not only taking this course together, but also we were all required to sing in the opera chorus. We sang as the chorus for the world premiere of Virgil Thompson's opera, Lord Byron. Commissioned by, but never performed by, the Metropolitan Opera, Lord Byron was given its send-off by the Juilliard Opera Theatre, which had its very talented and promising young roster of singers and used one of the school's fantastic orchestras. But for a chorus which figured largely in the opera, they had us, a crew of composers, conductors, pianists, and organists, who, while capable of singing the right notes and rhythms, had no voice quality or vocal projection, and who resented being forced to sing so much. We were being directed by the illustrious John Hausman, head of the drama division, who said to the chorus when we made our first entrance in an early rehearsal, Don't burst onto the stage like pips from a gooseberry amble. The renowned Alvin Ailey, no longer in dancing shape, was the choreographer who helped us amble in an organized fashion to the music. Since we were not drama students who would have known how to amble realistically and still be part of the crowd, and certainly could have effortlessly avoided seeming like pips bursting from a squished gooseberry. In addition to being given instructions by these two celebrated gentlemen, we were rehearsed by the choral conductor, Abraham Kaplan. He was preparing us for singing with the conductor Gerhard Samuel, who was leading the entire production of the opera. We gathered in a room with Abe Kaplan. He was relaxed, charming, precise, and focused. The very first chord of the opera was to be sung a cappella by the chorus, and this was the very first sound that the audience would hear because Virgil Thompson had written neither an overture nor even a brief phrase of orchestral music, no introduction at all. And he had decided that it would be exciting to begin the opera with an unaccompanied chorus singing a 12-note chord. You probably know that there are only 12 notes in the Western chromatic scale, which means that we were to sing all the notes at once upon entering the stage with no backup from the orchestra. The audience would be confronted by a cluster sung by composers, pianists, conductors, and organists. This would not go well. So, Abe Kaplan spoke to Virgil Thompson about this and requested that Mr. Thompson consider composing at least a phrase of music that would set up the sound for the chorus and even more set up the sound for the audience. Thompson agreed to write an introduction. What he wrote consisted of a snare drum roll and a glissando. This was either a deliberate nasty slap in the face to Mr. Kaplan and the chorus or an inexplicable lack of concern for his own opera. Was he making a joke as, at his own expense? Mr. Kaplan and all of us in the opera chorus thought when the orchestra first played the drum roll in the glissando that this was a practical joke played on us by the orchestra members. But no, it remained in the opera and that is exactly how Lord Byron began at the world premiere. When the performances of the opera were finally over, there was a huge it's over party and I stayed up with my chorus buddies partying until 3.30 in the morning. That same morning, I knew in the back of my reeling mind I had to be in Madame Longy's solfege class at 9 a.m. I showed up. I went to her class at 9 a.m. exhausted and hungover. The moment I sat down, 
I heard Madame Longy say, Mr. Adolf, to the piano. Right, to the piano, right. I got to the piano. Today was Bach day, which meant that we were to sight read a chorale in four clefs, and at any moment during this reading, Madame Longy would call out for us to transpose the key, or to sing one line and play the other three, or whatever technical torment she could think of. I went to the piano and sat down. <clears throat> Madame Longy said, Bach, page 123, play the soprano, alto, and bass. And solfege the tenor line, please. I started to do this, but I soon noticed that I had lapsed into a jazz interpretation of the chorale and was sliding all over the keyboard with chromatic interpolations and ornaments, and that as I was expanding the harmonies to include ninths and thirteenths, and suddenly I was just improvising on the tune with no relationship anymore to the Bach at all. Madame Longy did not interrupt me. She let me play for quite a long time. When I stopped, she said quietly, Thank you, Mr. Adolf. You may sit down. Not sure what was happening. I, I slid over to my seat. But the moment I sat in my seat, Madame Longy's voice boomed louder than ever. Mr. Adolf, do the piano. Bach, page 123. Play the soprano, alto, and bass, and solfege the tenor line, please. In shock, I bounced back up to the piano, and this time I did exactly what she wanted. Thank you, Mr. Adolf, she said triumphantly. You may be seated. While I was still an undergrad at Juilliard at age 19, I got a phone call from Dean Gordon Hardy asking if I would take over the solfege classes of James Weimer in the pre-college. Madame Longy had suggested that I teach solfege. Up to that moment, I had never been sure what she really thought of me because of all my antics in class. And I'll tell you the most famous antic. The most outrageous was the time I did the polyrhythm four against three with my pectoral muscles holding my shirt tight to my chest so she could see if I were doing it correctly. Now, she had simply said, Mr. Adolf, show me four against three without specifying that I had to use my hands to conduct the polyrhythm as we normally did in that class. So she could not object to my pectoral polyrhythmic performance without breaking her own rule. I did what she had said, and she could not amend her request. There is always a clear right and wrong in traditional solfege classes, melodic, harmonic, rhythmic dictations, and sight reading, right and wrong. When Madame Longy allowed me in my hungover state that one time to improvise instead of playing the Bach chorale as requested, she opened a door for me, but she closed it a moment later when she called me back to the piano to do the exercise correctly. One could imagine Another Bach chorale exercise, or maybe a game. It would be something like this. Play the chorale as written, then let it become more chromatic, then let the harmonies disintegrate and transform into something familiar but new, culminating in a return to the original but in a new key. I never liked giving tests. For a few years, I administered placement exams at the Juilliard Pre-College. These were tests that would determine what level course a student would take if accepted into the school. A seven-year-old boy nervously stepped into the testing room, practically shaking with worry. The idea that I should test this jittery child seemed cruel to me. I looked at his name on the name card. Sean Carney. Wait, I knew several Carneys, all violinists and all siblings. He must be one. His sister Lori was a friend, and we had just been at the Aspen Music Festival together in August, and it so happened that I had just stopped at the photo store to pick up the prints from the summer. Some of you will remember 
that there used to be photo shops where you had to go and pick up your prints. Well, so I did. So while Sean was nervously waiting for the first test question, I surreptitiously took the stack of photos out of my backpack and looked for a good photo of his sister. Sean, I said, the first question is, and I held up the photo of his sister. I said, who is this person in the photo? He blurted out, my sister. Correct, I said, adding, that is also the last question. You may go. Great, he shouted as he ran out of the room. Even Madame Longy would have had to agree that he passed the test and the first words out of his mouth were correct. I put him in a class with kids his own age and all was well. To be continued.